Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us. I think we're I think we're live. I'm going to continue as if we're live. So here goes. Thank you for joining this event as part of this year's Media Democracy Festival organized by the Media Reform Coalition. The Media Reform Coalition, as most people should know, works to bring together civil society groups, researchers and media practitioners to develop policies and campaign for media reform in light of a communications environment that continues to be dominated by a handful of large, powerful organizations, and it is characterized by insufficient plurality, I hate that word, diversity and accountability in far too often. I am Marcus Ryder um, from the Lenny Henry Center for Media Diversity, and I will be chairing today's discussion. I'm joined by a fantastic panel of speakers, each of whom will speak for, um, my script says five to six minutes, but I think it's gonna be more like 10 to 12 minutes. Um, and then we'll go to a discussion. So I hope that everybody has some really great questions that they will be able to ask. And please put them, put your questions in the in the group chat and we'll be picking some of those. Um, I will also be asking questions of the platform as well. So let me briefly introduce our amazing panelists today. We've got James Schneider, is a social, socialist strategist. He served as Jeremy Corbyn's and Labour's spokesperson and head of strategic communications from 2016 to 2020. Before that, he co-founded Momentum and was an Africa-focused journalist. He is now communications director for Progressive International. We also have um, Hilary Wainwright, waiting for her to, to flash up. Here we go, coming on slowly. Um, Co-editor of Red Pepper magazine and website. Her latest book is A New Politics from the Left um, and is a fellow transnational, from the fellow transnational, and is a fellow of the Transnational Institute. Um, Ellie Wainwright is the co-editor of Red Pepper magazine and you can follow her at Hilary Pepper and you can follow obviously Red Pepper magazine at, at Red Pepper Mag. Um, and then lastly, we have, but definitely not least, we have um, Victor Picard, is a professor at the University of Pennsylvania, Arenberg School for Communications, where he co-directs the Media Inequality and Change Center. His most recent book is Democracy Without Journalism. You can follow Victor at um, VW Picard, um, and you can obviously follow his university at um, Annenberg Penn. Um, School of Communications, um, and I don't think, I think I've missed out how you can follow James, so apologies for that, James. Um, you can follow James at Schneider Home, um, so there we go, so everyone can follow them on Twitter, and I'm sure that after um, the session we can also talk about how we can follow people, so we'll have all those details up afterwards. Uh, this is a, a really important issue for me, um, media reform. I feel that it is down to looking at the issue of monopsonies. It's looking down, looking at the issue with regards to uh, having far too um, people um, dominating the who purchases and who decides what is on our screens, what, what is in our newspapers and um, what is in our media generally. And so the need for either looking at how these economic models work and or looking at how they're regulated is incredibly important for our democracies and how we view ourselves and how we view each other. So that's my view, but I am chairing, so I will make sure that I'm not that much of an active chair. And so we will go, first of all, to James, who will give us a 10 minute speech. I'm gonna come in and if you go longer, James, I will nudge you. So James, Great, you thank you very much. Thank you, Marcus, and um, hi, everybody. Thank you all for coming. Um, so I'm assuming that if you're here, you probably already think or know that the media is neither particularly neutral or particularly free. And here's the secret. Most people already agree with you. Uh, trust in the media is already extremely low, but that doesn't mean that it's not powerful. It's extremely powerful because it can shape public attitudes especially when they're turning into some kind of moral panic. Take, for example, 
um, during austerity and when George Osborne was chancellor, um, the idea of scroungers and strivers. Uh, this was a big campaign in the media. And uh, there was a poll conducted in 2013, which found that uh, the public thought that on average over a quarter of the social social security budget was stolen in benefit fraud when the truth was actually less than 1%. So even though the media isn't trusted, it's still incredibly powerful. So we can't afford to not be part of a, a movement and a struggle for media reform. And we can't either, if we're interested in progressive social change, just treat it fatalistically like the weather, something that we can't change and that's just going to hit us over the head again and again. So, you know, I think it's important that we see the media is, is an active force. It's not a static force. It, it isn't unchanging. It changes a lot. The media is going through a lot of flux at the moment with working out how to pay for journalism, with the the you know the, the rise of the internet, the, the the fall of print. And this provides openings. There are always openings through new technology to those who want to change the established order, whether that's in a progressive or a reactionary direction. And I just want to go through a few examples of that that we've seen in, in the last decade. These you know hacks or or openings that that they open up for a bit, but we see that they don't last forever. But people can have real impact. Uh, uh, in the media or in uh, political world through it. So take, for example, the Arab Spring. We saw uh, social media played an enormous role there in getting around state media uh, and changing uh, what people were able to see, how people were able to organise, getting around the established media. But now those platforms, those social media platforms, are much harder to use for politics and organising. The algorithms have been changed and they're much less friendly. Um, but in, say, the 2017 UK general election, the Facebook algorithm was, was accidentally perfect for to help progressive news stories go viral. Um, it, the print coverage of Labour, for example, was uh, at the time was almost overwhelmingly hostile, but online was very positive because there was a there was a desire for people to read um, reporting of us that was either supportive or that was fair and balanced. Uh, and so the independent newspaper, for example, or online paper, uh, had enormous readership, rose dramatically uh, during the election, pretty much entirely from Facebook uh, users, re readers coming from Facebook, um, because they were writing up our story of the day, our policy announcement of the day, and they were writing up that up fairly but Facebook has changed their algorithm and things are, are rather different um, that doesn't mean that they can't be used so you know viral videos were a big thing in both the 2017 and 2019 general election campaigns for um, the Corbyn team and the Momentum team and they were able to get outside of people's social media bubbles and the figures are really quite you know really quite stark like you know two-thirds of um, uh, fa uh, Facebook users in some constituencies watching a momentum video uh, during a general election campaign. That is an enormous power that you can, you know, reaching people, uh, you know, that you can't get with uh, that you can't get with advertising. But again, Facebook's algorithm will will change and make that more difficult. Um, another hack opened up um, due to broadcasting impartiality rules, which are meant to give uh, Labour relatively equal airtime. Um, in general elections, and that worked a lot in 2017, and we saw that in 2017. But by 2019, the Tories have worked out how to to game that system somewhat and make uh, stories be about claim and counterclaim rather than journalists actually assessing them. So it just sounded like lots of noise, and he said, she said. So take, for example, uh, Labour's big claim, our big claim of the general election, which was these leaked trade documents le uh, between um, the US and the UK, which showed that the NHS was on the table for privatization to US American healthcare companies in a future trade deal. And we're already seeing how this is true and this is coming out. The Tories just said, no, that's not true. There's The NHS is not on the table. And rather than it being reported for what it was, it was, well, Labour say this and the Tories say that, and then they wipe their hands of it. Now, so that's that opening closing a bit, and it will likely close further if the Daily Mail's group editor in chief, Paul Dacre, ends up heading the broadcast regulator Ofcom. Uh, 
uh, it doesn't it, the the media can be hijacked in reactionary directions donald trump did so incredibly well in the 2016 uh, uh us american election campaign he generated controversy often just on his twitter account uh, and that led to what's been calculated at five billion dollars worth of uh, of um, unpaid for coverage, which was more than uh, you know the next five or six candidates, pretty much all the other candidates in both sets of primaries, both Republican and Democrat together. Um, and so, yes, we know that Trump's accounts have been shut down, so he can't use that them but before we cheer and get very excited the same thing can and indeed is happening to progressive leaders in other countries and will also happen here it's happened in ecuador it's happened in other countries and new methods open up like um uh, the bolsonaro campaign in brazil used whatsapp very effectively to communicate uh, to people and get around parts of the media um ecuador's elections which are currently on, on uh, underway tiktok makes a big uh, makes a big play and gives a, a small window for people to get their message through in a different way. And the, the point of all of these openings is that if you can present people with an alternative, with different messages than what they're getting through the mainstream media or most of the media, that has an, the effect of dragging the priorities of, the, of, of some of the media in that direction. So I think that, you know, one thing to bear in mind when we're thinking about the media reform and how we can change the media is how we can be tactically nimble to see these openings uh, and to take advantage of them. But clearly, you know, not just because in every single example I've given, these, uh, these windows, these openings lasted for a couple of years and then were shut down. We need more than tactics. We're going to need uh, a more comprehensive strategy for, for changing the media. So, you know, and I'm a socialist, so for me, um, that strategy should be linked to a broader strategy of changing society. And so today I'd like to argue that there are three strategic postures that we should adopt. People that are interested in media reform should adopt and then apply those to three different models of change to come up with a kind of comprehensive strategy for media reform. The, the first of those postures is, to put it simply, controversy, right? We have to get noticed to shift the priorities of the uh, of of the media, to shift the editorial uh, decisions that are taken by broadcasters, particularly broadcasters, more importantly than print, and the way you do that is by controversy, because we live in an attention economy. You now, look how uh, Extinction Rebellion, for example, um, put climate change onto the agenda through direct action, or uh, in reverse, look at how. Uh, the right use um, culture wars uh, uh, imagery in order to shift attention, like the so the the, prote the protecting against no threat whatsoever of the Churchill statue during the both the Black Lives Matter protests and those um, after the disgraceful policing of the, of the Sarah Everard um, vigil last week. So we should think about. Um, what are the things that we can do to, to shift the media's attention to particular issues? And that's what all activists should be thinking about all of the time. The second posture is about how we develop our narrative against the billionaire owned and billionaire influenced media. And how do we integrate their attacks against progressive movements and activists as we'll, we'll see, we've always seen and will continue to see into our own narratives and stories. And the third is to build new media, new independent media, and to be active within existing media. It's not an either or. You know, I think we both need to expand independent institutions so that they can uh, speak for themselves, be more sustainable, and do the kind of truth-seeking journalism that we love them to do. But also, uh, we can't just uh, disengage from where most people are getting their information, and we need to have uh, a plan to change that and to shift that into the direction that's more interested in in fact-based journalism and uh, journalism that challenges power. So I, I think that we apply these three strategic postures to three different types of change, which I'm basically stealing from Eric Olin Wright, who was a, uh, a great academic who died a couple of years ago in his book, Envisaging Real Utopias. So he says there are three different types of change. There's interstitial change, which is actions in the here and now. 
so little openings that we can that, that we can make for how that we can how we can get it so this would be how movements can interact with corporate media now how it can shift their priorities in small ways that uh, that that can make a change now but they don't necessarily add up to uh to something else um but at the same time, we have to build alternative media so that we aren't just being a drop in the ocean. The second type of change is evolutionary. So that's both sort of change from within and change from without. So to change from within, that involves, um, uh, for example, you know, pressure on organisations like the BBC and others to uh, improve their diversity. Um, to That means organisations that are good at booking um, uh, progressive and independent voices on complaint system that challenges um, uh, blatant acts of bias um, and also change from without by building uh, the independent media ecosystem that can uh, that can also challenge these institutions. Um, then the, there's the third type of change which is the ruptural type of change, the big changes that can happen and I think that's where we need to build uh, the policies and ideas that we would like to see a progressive government in the future bring forward or maybe not a progressive government maybe a less progressive government could be pushed into these policies by fantastic campaigns and movements to support them so these are the things like things that you would have heard about this week at other media uh, democracy festival events like how do we democratize the bbc how do we free it from the grip of uh, of government control appointing rishi sunak's former boss and conservative party donor to be the chair or, so, or things like how do we tax big tech companies to fund public interest journalism? And so I think you know, part of our strategy needs to be building up the demand for radical overhaul and democratization of the media, which is exactly what events like this and this festival have been doing. So I think overall to have a, have a plan to reform the media, to engage with the media is gonna be very, very, very difficult. But I think if we engage in some of those activities I've, I've laid out, then we can have real success, real tangible success in the short term, changing their priorities, building the alternative and building a vision for the longer term for how we would build a genuinely democratic communication system, a media system that would change what is reported, which would transform the media so it exists genuinely to seek truth and to challenge power rather than hide truth and prop up power. Thanks very much. So well, there's going to be, sorry, I think my mic only just came on. Um, so thank you very much, James. I'm sure there's going to be lots of questions um, with regards to what you've just said. I'm very interested in how you act, what regulations might need to be imposed for creating a framework. And I'm also going to, if you can think on um, uh, what are the economic models that are to actually sustain that independent media, especially in times when even um, media which is backed by millionaires seems to and billionaires um, seems to be struggling so I'd be very curious if you've got any ideas on that okay but while you're thinking on that and I'm sure other people have lots of other questions we've got Hillary so Hillary Rainwright um, if who is um, running independent media and is I'm um, hoping surviving and thriving in these difficult times um, would love to hear your ideas on media reform Oh, we, we seem to be having a problem with your your mic. I don't know if we can unmute you, Hillary. Unmuted. There you go. All right. If you can start again, that would be great. Oh, no, you've, you're muted again. There we are. Sorry, it's something to do with my battery. Anyway, if I, I might have to change computers, but anyway, um, Thanks, Marcus, and thanks to the organisers of this really um, impressive festival, particularly thanks to them for linking the question of democracy and the question of media reform, because I want to talk very much about the link between democracy and political reform uh, and, and media and media reform. Um, I mean, this the theme of this session is media reform, 
possibility, like the possible, likely enough. And I really want to insert necessity at the beginning, because I, I maybe everybody accepts this, and it's obvious. But I just think that um, that um, a, 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 a plural, truly plural, not just a matter of many voices all saying the same thing, but really genuinely giving a giving a platform and a, and a and enabling every voice to be heard. So really inclusive plurality um, is essential for a true democracy. I mean, just to back this up, I think it's it's not accidental that the champion of the free press uh, in the, the brief period we had of a, a revolution, um, John, John Milton, he, he was also um, the, the defender of the execution of Charles I, the defender of our brief republic, uh, and of the attempt at a democratic revolution, and so I don't think that that combination is 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 accidental. That he saw a free press as essential to the the sustaining of a, a genuine democracy. And just to quote a key uh, element to that, he said at one point he said um, in this in the Areopagitica, his his sort of famous polemic for free speech, he said. Where there is much desire to learn, there of necessity will be much arguing, much writing, many opinions. For opinion in good men and women, I'd add, is but knowledge in the making. So that idea of debate, argument, many opinions, many, much writing, much arguing, is knowledge in the making, is crucial to the idea of uh, developing a, a, a knowing and a capable citizen. Uh, which is fundamental to democracy. And that's really um, what the media should be. It should be not just about the right of powerful people to print what they want. It should be enabling ordinary people to hear and to give voice to um, the whole plurality of opinions uh, in, in society. Um, and so in a way, well, we saw also in 2018 and 2019, in ways that um, James has referred to, the way in which an undemocratic media can actually be a block on democratic change, you know, in the way that they, the media effectively was a key block on the possibility of a, a radical democratic Labour government. And so I want to talk a bit about the experience of Red Pepper, but in a way that generalises, it's not just about Red Pepper, but generalises to a notion of change which would add a dimension to the three levels that um, James drew from Eric Olin Wright. So um, it would also be, I mean, I'm trying to add the idea of prefigurative change. It's a kind of, you could say it's an inter interstitial change. And it's also about, uh, so it's about change in the here and now, but in a way that prefigures a possible future as well as campaigning for a, a possible future. And so I think that a lot of the, um, the alternative media, not just Red Pepper, but Navarra, uh, New Internationalist and others, all in different ways prefigure the kind of plural, inclusive media that we, we really want, accountable media too. I mean, um, maybe just something about that history, the relationship between media and politics in our own history in Red Pepper. I mean, we, we, we were born in a way out of a feeling of uh, disenfranchisement. So we saw the media as a kind of way of, or an alternative media, as a way of breaking from the um, the, the completely um, centralised, um, middle of the road nature of politics. The fact that uh, because we lacked an electoral, a, a proportional electoral system, a plural electoral system, the, the main parties were always competing for the centre and always in a way um, ending up saying the same kind of thing as we're seeing now with the Labour Party, you know, moving more and more towards towards the, the space occupied by the Tory party. And so we, we created Red Pepper as a way of, of breaking the, that, that, that sort of hold of the centre. You know, our adverts initially said, feeling disenfranchised, you know, and, and, and then said, we need an alternative press. But you know, in a way, we were a bit we were a bit naive in a way to think that that the that a pre an alternative press could 
itself break through and um, uh, and provide that voice effectively. Because very soon we came up against um, the, the features of the economic environment, particularly of the mainstream media. And in particular, when we once we we all knew about the monopolistic um, nature of the the mainstream media, but we hadn't, and that was mainly in terms of production. You know the the three companies that dominate the production of newspapers, but but we we weren't fully prepared for the monopolization of the distribution of of media. So actually, whether or not Red Pepper was available to people, you know, depended on Smith's Menzies. Two, I think they maybe think maybe Smith's own Menzies. But anyway, so it was a completely monopolized distribution system. And we were available in, I think we were available in Euston Smiths and one or two others. And that was that was good because people did know where to buy us, as well as the alternative bookshops. And then one day, almost you know, out of the blue, we were just wiped from the shelves. And it turned out that Smiths had decided, in the interest of its profit margins, that um that magazines were to compete with you know sandwiches crisps sushi and so on and also within the magazine sort of department as it were anything that wasn't backed by a huge advertising budget you know was just eliminated so we we we'd heard about the example in um france and germany where um after the war the defeat of fascism in thinking about what are the conditions to avoid fascism emerging again? Um, they, the the sort of post um, post war governments, decided it was important to create, almost following Milton, um, to create the conditions for a plurality of voices. So they created legislation that required every news agent to to sell whatever was being printed. <clears throat> so you know, for example, when if you go on holiday in Italy or or France, you can find, um, or you used to be able to find Il Manifesto or um, the Communist Uni, Uni, Unita, the the communist newspapers were all available in you know even the most obscure country village in the newsagent there because of this legislation, and it was legislation based on in a way the idea. <clears throat> of information and debate and plurality of opinions as a public good, i.e. It, it wasn't to be left to the market. And I think that's a fundamental principle of any kind of <clears throat> any freedom of the press is, is the idea of debate and information and knowledge as actually a public good that has to be protected by legislation. And that's where I think this idea of the likelihood of media reform. I honestly think, although we must campaign for it all the time, I think so long as we've got a government that can't even recognise, you know, the, the public good of of test and trace in the middle of a pandemic, uh, but th sees everything in terms of the market and opportunities for the private sector, <clears throat> has got no real notion of the public good. I can't see how we're going to get the kind of media reform that we need, but we've got to keep fighting for it. But we've also got to, to, to even more urgently create it and create an alternative here and now that can um, that can both create the basis for an alternative infrastructure of, of the media and, and alternative legislation and, and funding and so on when we do get a radical Labour government. Um, so in in Red Pepper, we've tried to prefigure that in in different ways. So we've tried to create a, a magazine that is is plural. You know, we recognised initially that our our origins were more in the sort of slightly white dominated, very white dominated left of the sixties and seventies and eighties. And so we created a, a race editor to positively discriminate and ensure bring on. Um, voices from the Bain community, and now we have a, a an editorial um, collective uh, of over twelve people, which is predominantly um, people of colour and and women, uh, and and I think that's really important and has meant a, a shift in the kind of voices available um, and, and 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 there in the in the magazine. I think also 
it's really important that we've got some kind of democratic structure. So we're moving more and more towards a cooperative uh, in which readers and supporters would have some real say. I think the final thing, because I understand, is that we're trying to create a, a, an infrastructure of the radical media. So collaborate rather than compete with other parts of the left media. So we can we can collaborate on, in terms of funds, trying to, to, to find some common funds, um, because we need that for some kind of public good journalism rather than market-led journalism. We need that public infrastructure. So I think that what we're trying to do with other parts of the alternative media is create exactly those conditions that, that, that Milton talked about, in which there's a plurality of argument, a plurality of debate, and that's what will create the conditions for a really um, deep kind of democratic reform. Thank you so much, Hilary. I couldn't agree more with you with regards to looking at the issue of monop monopolies and um, as in distribution and other elements as well. I'm really interested in what you were saying with regards to looking at editorial um, boards as well. So I'd be curious um, whether there is, whether we need, even if we're not looking for progressive um, uh, socialist reform, currently um, several American financial regulators are saying that they will delist companies if they don't hit certain um, gender and, and race targets for their management boards. And so I'd be curious, and that's, and it's definitely not a socialist agenda, um, but I'd be curious if um, we should think about um, something like that. And I'm also very interested with regards to public funding. So you might want to think about that, whether um, we should be in receipt of public funding to um, economically help publications like yourself, or whether that would actually co-opt um, and might editorially challenge the independence of um, uh, publications like yours. So these are things which I'm interested in, but there might be other questions that are coming through. Um, but those are things you might want to want to think on. I'm just giving you advance warning. Okay, so last but not least, we have Victor Picard. He's a professor at the University of Pennsylvania Annenberg School for Communication. Um, I said before, he co-directs the Media Inequality and Change Center. Um, Victor, the floor is all yours and I'll make sure that you're unmuted, which I think you are. Excellent, thank you, Marcus. I wanna thank you all. I wanna thank the Media Reform Coalition uh, and all the, the organizers behind the scenes, as well as my fellow panelists and also our viewers and listeners, uh, both who are tuning in right now or listen to the show uh, later on. I'm gonna be building on uh, what James and Hillary were, were discussing. I'm really enjoying the, the direction of this discussion. I also really wanna get into the Q and A. So I'll try not to talk too long. I'll be talking about what's wrong with our media, why it matters, and what we should do about it. And I'm I'm going to be focusing a fair amount on the U.S. media system, um, not simply because that's the system I know best, but also I'd argue that it presents us a special case study, a kind of cautionary tale of what not to do. Uh, and of course, many of the problems we're dealing with here in the states, you're also enjoying in the U.K. Here in the US, we've been running what you might describe as a dangerous experiment uh, for the past century or so, where almost all of our news and information is coming from a heavily commercialized media system, one that's overly reliant on advertising revenue. Um, even our newspaper uh, industry has been uh, deriving its revenues about 80% from advertising, 20% from uh, various kinds of reader support going back to the late 1800s. Our broadcasting system, of course, went down a similar path. Um, and uh, many people don't know this, we actually had a kind of regulatory debate in the early 30s where we almost ended up with something slightly more like the BBC. Uh, but of course, we, we uh, lost uh, that argument um, and uh, we've ended up with a very commercialized system. Our cable television obviously went down the same path as did the internet itself, so that a pernicious commercial system, a, a pernicious commercial logic drives many of these systems. It's always about capturing our attention to sell to advertisers, whether we're talking about Fox News or Facebook. It's about the profit imperative. And I think it's important to keep the structural roots of many of our problems in focus. 
Now, for all of its faults, and I know there are many, I spent the last year living in, in, in the UK. I was living in London, and many of my British friends beat out uh, whatever romanticism I still had about the BBC. But still, you all have a much stronger public media sector than we do in the US. Ours is almost entirely commercial. It's dominated by, to call them oligopolies, is probably overly generous. And they're barely regulated at all in terms of public interest protections. So this kind of system doesn't try to inform us. It's mere, it merely seeks to entertain us, to keep our eyes glued to various screens. It doesn't try to change the world in any sort of progressive sense. It seeks to maintain and manage the status quo. And it wants to make as much money as legally, sometimes illegally, uh, as possible. These benefits largely go to a small group of owners and investors, largely wealthy white men. So why does this matter? Um, it's fairly intuitive in, in many ways, but I'd argue that this has debased our media system uh, in, in two general ways. One is that it amplifies low what, what scholars sometimes refer to as low quality information that sensationalizes and trivializes important issues. And this is best captured by that infamous quote that I'm sure many of you uh, have heard, uh, probably all of you have heard before by Les Movies when uh, the CEO of CBS, when he was describing the constant media coverage of Donald Trump leading up to the 2016 election. And he said, this may not be good for America, but it's damn good for CBS. And this priceless quote captures so much of what's wrong with American media, with, with commercial media writ large. The system's always been good for business, but often bad for democracy. It's good for a handful of corporations and billionaires, but often bad for everyone else, especially journalists, communities of color, and other disadvantaged groups. Now, of course, there are exceptions. Uh, and as a scholar, I'm supposed to be nuanced and, and even-handed and, and all of that good stuff. Certainly a commercial system is capable of producing good journalism from time to time. It also presents opportunities for progressive voices and messages to get through, but this is becoming increasingly difficult to do, which brings me to the second structural problem in profit-driven media systems. And this one's coming more into focus in recent years which is that this commercial logic doesn't support the jobs, the, the number of journalists that we need. It doesn't support the production of reliable information that democratic society requires. And of course, oftentimes it's very expensive to produce good journalism. We have a worsening journalism crisis here in the States and you do in the UK as well, especially where local journalism is rapidly disappearing. The U.S. newspaper industry has lost well over 50% of its employees over the last two decades. We've lost about roughly about a fifth of all of our newspapers. We're seeing news deserts spread across the country where entire communities and regions lack access to any local news media whatsoever. And into this void, all manner of disinformation, especially the right wing variety, is rushing in. This kind of system breeds racism. It breeds fascism. So regardless of what your main political issue might be, whether it's climate change or confronting structural inequalities, such problems are insurmountable without a functioning press system. So what's to be done? Our, our, the, our, the, final, the final question, the key question, those of us on the left are often better at the critique side of things, but we're not as good at imagining alternative systems. The right wing's been much better at this, I, I would argue. It's why we're often living in their social reality and, and, and not ours. Progressives need to think more systematically about media failures. It's not just bad actors and bad apples. It's the entire system that's driven by these commercial logics and is governed by captured regulatory regimes. And again, I know these are similar problems that you're dealing with in the UK. So we need to not just react to current systemic failures. Instead of thinking, we need to be thinking constructively about how we design a new media system. We need to, as much as possible, learn how to take journalism out of the market. We need to change the system at its structural roots, change the underlying logics, the incentives, the policies, the ownership structures. We need to be structural and radical. 
but it has to be when we change, when we move journalism, try to remove it from the market or minimize commercial pressures, we're basically talking about creating a public system, but it has to be public, truly public, not just in name only. We have to decommercialize and democratize. And this means local ownership and control. Newsrooms must look like the communities they purportedly serve. Journalists themselves should run and operate their own news outlets. Any media reform worthy, any media reform project worthy of its name should seek to transform our media system. And despite all the, the doom and gloom uh, throughout my own work, and if we just take a casual glance at, at our current uh, media system, there's also reason for hope. This crisis is a, is a critical juncture. I, I agree that there are openings that James uh, referred to earlier. And I do think Eric Olin Wright, I was thrilled to hear him uh, mention Wright's work. I spend the, the final uh, conclusion chapter of my recent book just focused on Eric Olin Wright's template on um, how to uh, decommercialize spaces, how to build on these public spaces to tame and erode and replace commercial systems over time. So I do think that's a, that's a useful uh, roadmap to, to approach many of these problems. So this crisis is also an opportunity to entirely reimagine what our news media could and should look like. And I think on that more uh, positive note, um, I'll end for now, but I hope that we can get into some of the policy details and some of the strategies um, in, our, in our discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Victor. I have lots of questions. I'm really interested in how you actually take um, journalism out of the market um, with regards to how do you then finance that journalism. Um, and so I think you are our final speaker, so I'm hoping that the other three, two panelists are gonna be coming up. Ah, it's wonderful. Technology works. So talking of technology, one of the questions which has come in while everyone's been talking is about the tech giants. So I'm assuming the mean Facebook, Twitter, et cetera. And one of the questions is how can we stop and should we stop tech giants interfering in elections? Um, there are two questions, one saying how can we stop tech giants interfering in elections? And another question which is related is should we ban social media platforms from being forums for political debate. Um, who wants to take that first? I'm going to go to James because you've got first-hand experience of that, but don't worry, Victor and Hillary, I'll be coming to you afterwards. Uh, no social media platforms should not, um, political, you know, political debate should not be banned from, from uh, the, the tech giant platforms. The problem with the tech giant platforms is that they are, uh, they're basically the public forum. They are the place where public uh, public discussion takes place, but they are completely non-transparent. You don't know the rules that they're governed by. You don't know how they're taking decisions. Um, and this might seem qu you know quite small fry, but it it's not. There was this absolutely explosive internal memo uh, that was uh, written and revealed last year, written by Facebook. Um, if you Google Sophie Zhang. Uh, memo where she said that she had blood on her hands because she was responsible for and in a completely understaffed unit for um, uh, politics taking place in lots of countries on Facebook and she said that there was a huge amount of fake news and bots in the, uh, the for right wing ones in the Bolivian election in in 2019 which ended with a military coup backed by you know backed by the far right and she said that she had she had blood on her hands. So the thing that we need to do, I think, is to mount what can be global campaigns, demanding that, uh, at least with respect to politics, but really further, that the that the, the these platforms are regulated like public utilities for the for the purposes of um, uh, you know transparently for the purposes of public debate. You're muted. Thank you. Had to happen. I, I'm going to be following up um, about what, how that regulation or the form of that regulation. But before I do that, um, Hillary, do you should social media platforms be banned or places free of political debate? No, no. I mean, I agree with James here. It's a question of how do we get some 
sort of control and make accountable these media giants. I mean, I I think the idea of campaigning is is not completely unrealistic because the point about these media giants is even though they are effectively monopolies, I mean, you know, bigopolies is a bit generous, as somebody said, um, they are very um, brand sensitive. They do, you know, like all this Google stuff, you know, can't do no evil. I mean, it can be thoroughly evil, but it does care about its image. And so uh, campaigns that sort of expose and 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 uh, name and shame them, I think can be important. Um, I think also, I mean, there is a huge kind of alternative um, techie community that's attempted alternatives to Facebook. Um, and I, don't, I think that's very difficult. But still, there's that the, we have huge allies amongst people that are extremely um, tech savvy who could help in time to, um, you know, force the transparency of their uh, logarithms and so on, partly through hacking, partly through exposing. Um, so I think, you know, the ultimate idea must be firstly regulation and then some idea, some recognition that these are the new commanding heights, as it were, of the economy and do need to be ultimately made into public utilities. And I think there's more and more awareness of that, partly through the the, the way in which during the lockdown, so we've all become so reliant um, on these these tech, this tech infrastructure. So um, I think that we, we we can't talk about banning um, debate on social media. It's about how we do we get control. How do we make the social media truly social, truly public? Uh, and you know, um, uh, Labour's proposal about public broadband now is kind of like. Um, a common sense idea. And so you can see how quickly um, the basic sort of understanding of the population of the problems grows. And we must build on that and create a, um, you know, a movement for, a, for public control over these monopolies. I mean, including, I mean, one thing that does shock people is the way that they use our daily information, the way that, you know, everybody knows the way that if you know, that Google and Facebook um, quickly use any sort of online buying we do and then start bombarding us with adverts um, about whatever it is that we're buying. And people can see that they're being exploited as consumers. <clears throat> and the idea that's in um, the wonderful media manifesto that uh, Natalie Fenton and Des Freeman have produced of basically taxing them for that use of public information and then that money going to fund um, the kind of ecology of different sorts of media, including not-for-profit media, um, I think is a really good one. I mean, just making, making people aware that they are using our daily information that we don't consider, we just consider it almost private information, what we order online, is now utterly commercialised. So that sort of datification of our daily life you know is is a is, is an abuse that i think people are becoming more and more aware of and we must build on that awareness in our campaigns okay victor i'm interested in whether we need to regulate whether we need to um uh, uh look at ways in which to increase the number of social media platforms to break up the monopolies um, and whether they're actually a, a force for good because um, James for example talked about being able to um, have a window at one point of being able to get quite progressive stuff on the platforms that would not have been possible in mainstream media so what's what's your view as to what should we do with these tech giants and these social media platforms Yes, I totally agree with Hillary and James that these platform monopolies have far too much power and we need to bring them under democratic control. And that public utility regulation is a good, uh, a good approach towards those aims. And of course, this is also going to have to be a globally uh, coordinated 
um, regulatory intervention. Right now in the United States, you see this problem really come to the fore. And I think the question about you know, whether we should regulate them or try to create some you know, more competition um, is, is, is really central right now. And for better or for worse, the, there's a growing anti-monopoly movement, I'd say largely for better um, in the United States. But um, the focus there has been that we should just simply smash up the platform monopolies, which sounds cool. I mean, I, I love this idea of just smashing up Facebook but it really um, beneath the surface is relying on a kind of market logic that if only we have more competition, then the market will self-correct. And that's why I think this public utility regulatory model um, is something that we really need to focus on because it is an important communication infrastructure. We're all gonna have to rely on it for our, our progressive uh, politics. And um, I think if there's there could be ways to make it more democratically accountable. I also love the idea that they should be taxed to help fund public service journalism. I've got a proposal out that's suggesting that as well. And I know there are a, num a number of great ideas along those lines. The only problem is that in most places right now, for example, in Australia, uh, the, the, the emphasis is that Facebook and Google should simply share their advertising revenue back to the commercial publishers who themselves are complicit, like Rupert Murdoch, for example, are complicit in many of our, our media related problems. So I don't, I think it must go into a public media fund. Um, so we've got a number of great ideas out there. It's just gonna require the right politics to push them forward. Okay, you've brought up the idea of a public media fund and we've got one question in the, in the group chat, which is how does um, PBS and the NPR affect the media system in the US and how are they funded? So I'd be curious as to um, whether we can look at ways or what ways we should look at at funding public media. And uh, once we, we look at that, especially if it's going to be coming um, from some sort of taxation, such as um, the BBC, who that public media should be accountable for. So if we are looking at, at funding models, Hillary, would you be interested in getting government money equivalent to, to the BBC? If, um, or would you be interested in other forms of funding models? Hillary, assuming that, you know, we are looking to fund more independent media or make sure that independent media such as yourselves um, can flourish, what would be the best way? What would be the best market intervention to make sure that you would be able to, to flourish? What should be the re media reform? Okay, I think we're having a few technical problems with Hillary, so I'm going to go to to James, then Victor, and hopefully Hillary will be able to will will have sorted out Hillary's um, tech problems. So, so James, should we be looking at taxation and public money funding some of these independent institutions? Yeah, I <clears throat> I think so. I mean, I, I think there's a, a a great opportunity to take some of the the super profits from the the big tech companies and ring fence it into uh, a public fund, which can then distribute that money to um, to public interest and and community journalism. Uh, and I think that would, you know, that would really just begin to change the uh, the ecosystem. And you could set that up in such a way that it's not that that it's a million miles away from government funding. You know, the government can negotiate to get the money from uh, from the the big tech companies to place that into uh, a fund, which is then managed transparently and independently from the government, and also which could have democratic elements to it. I mean, you know, for example. Uh, you, if you had um, the BBC took um, uh, all of the publicly paid for content that's ever been paid, uh, you know, ever been made, the whole BBC archive, the whole Channel Four archive, every museum exhibition that's been publicly funded, uh, fi uh, film, theatre filming, uh, uh, art gallery, everything that was all placed on uh, on iPlayer. And all you had to do was go in with your with your password, and then everything is uh, everything is there. You could also use that system for democratic commissioning. 
for people could say we want to have you know i want to support um, this type of public interest journalism, and you could, you, you know, you could begin to develop um, both a public, but not, you know, not public as in controlled from the top, a public uh, and and democratic uh, media system. Okay, uh, Victor, we're still having a little trouble getting Hillary back. Um, Victor, how do you think that there's any possibility of getting public money funding independent? Um, news organizations in the US? And if so, how could it be done? Yes, so all of my recent work is focused on this exact question. And um, it's often counterintuitive, uh, at least for many Americans, because we've been socialized to believe that this is antithetical to American core uh, press freedoms, that the government should never get involved in such a way. But in fact, if you know American history, you know that media subsidies, public media subsidies are as American as apple pie going back to our, our postal system, which was primarily a newspaper delivery uh, infrastructure. And so I think uh, history shows that it can, it has happened uh, here in the United States. Right now, our public media are woefully underfunded. We pay at the federal level about a buck 35 uh, per person per year. We're almost literally off the chart compared to other democratic countries around, around the world. But I do think there's a growing awareness that there simply is no commercial future, especially for local journalism. Uh, the market is simply not going to solve this. In fact, the market is making things much worse. The market's driving journalism into the ground. So um, there's going to have to be public media sub subsidies are basically public service journalism's last best hope. Uh, and I do think slowly you're seeing a constituency for this. You're starting to see it at the state level, like New Jersey, for example, is subsidizing local journalism. There are a number of experiments happening. And also even at the federal level right now, we're, reckon we're realizing that there's such a journalism crisis that government's going to have to intervene. There are many different ways where we could come up with the money. Um, and that's another discussion. But it's really the political will that's, that's necessary. Okay. Um, I Well, we still haven't got... We still haven't got Hillary back, but that's fine for now. I'm sure it's, hopefully she's listening, so she'll be able to contribute um, when she when she comes um, back. Um, so one of the things which I'm interested in, especially in the States, is the role of charities in, in the media. So I think the Charities Commission in the UK recently recognized um, some journalism as a public good, and it, there was problems previously for charities directly funding journalism. Should we see this as a positive? Should journalism be seen as, as, cha as a charitable cause? Or is that basically just giving up hope that we'll ever be economically viable? Um, uh, let's start with Victor, um, due to the fact that I think charities play a major role in um, parts of um, public journalism in America. I think, please correct me if I'm wrong, Sure, it's true to a certain extent. It certainly plays a larger role here in the States than it does in the UK, simply because there's a lot more money in the philanthropic community. Um, and there's a lot of excitement about nonprofit ventures right now. I'm excited about them. I think there's some fantastic exemplars we can point to. But at, at the same time, I think we have to be absolutely clear that the kind of systemic market failure that we're dealing with will not be solved by private capital alone. Um, there, in fact, every calculation I've ever seen, there's even with all the billions of dollars that we have in the charitable, in the foundations and in the charitable world, there's not enough to save all journalism uh, across the board. It's going to require a public media system. That's a system that's driven by universal service logic. Uh, unfortunately, with the in the in the private foundation world, they can save a paper here and there, or create a news a new outlet here and there, but they're not. It's not a systemic fix. So, so cautious optimism on that front, but ultimately we're going to need something more than just uh, philanthropies uh, propping up journalism. James, do you think that charities could play a role, or are I, we looking I at one one hundred percent? Yes, there should be uh, you know charitable status sh uh, should be there, and charities can can and do do good things, but it's not uh, it's not uh, a systemic, it's not a structural issue. I. I I couldn't say what Victor said as well as he did. I just completely agree with him. Okay, I'll move on quickly and I'll do something a bit more UK focused for you, James. There have been a few um, questions that have come in about Paul Dacre um, uh, heading heading off com and um, predictably for um, this type of uh, session, people are not don't seem overjoyed with um, Paul Dacre 
um, taking over Ofcom. Um, who would we want to take over Ofcom, or who would you want to take over Ofcom? And or do we want Ofcom? Does Ofcom need to be reformed? Is Ofcom the regulator that that we need? I'd be curious as to what your views are on how we've talked about regulation. Does Ofcom do a good job? If it does, wonderful. We can all go home. If it doesn't, um, how would we want to reform our regulator? What kind of regulation do we want? So I don't have a candidate in the race for for the, for the Ofcom chief. Um, it, it it should be somebody who um, has a clear track record of supporting, uh, you know, balance, impartiality, truth seeking, fact based journalism, and uh, that's not Paul Dacre. Paul Dacre is responsible for uh, journal uh, journalism that is based on hatred, not on fact. Uh, and that obscures the truth and that props up the interests of the powerful. So he is almost uniquely badly qualified to to be a head of Ofcom. Now that's not to say that the regulator is perfect. It's it, it, it of course isn't, and there are things that could be improved. So you know, for example, part of the reason why um, uh, stuff on iPlayer goes off after thirty days or something, so that we don't have access to all of the content that we've all paid for um, uh, collectively over the years. Uh, is an Ofcom regulation, so there's room there's room for changes there, and that would happen, I think, if there were um, the kind of political will and movement along sort of along the lines that Victor was talking about to create this public utility universal service viewing um, uh, journalism as a public good and as something that needs to be supported outside of either the logic of government control or the logic of billionaire control. It needs to be taken out of the market and freed from government control. Okay, just just one small point before I move on to Victor about, about regulation. The 30 days um, on iPlayer, isn't that more to do with um, IP? And the no, no, no. Deals? no, 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 it's to support, it, it's, a, it's to support the commercial competitors because, um, uh, then, uh, then there's less stuff up for for the com commercial competitors and the IP. I mean, we own it. You know, we um, we this is this is BBC stuff that we've paid for. Okay, all right. Um, okay, we could get into some real nitty gritty with regards to um, indie supplies into um, into the BBC and versus the the in house and and w which I who owns that IP and the role of, of PACT on that. But I'd be curious, so I'm, I'm not sure, I'm, I'm absolutely not sure, but I'm sure it's, it's far too long and boring a conversation to have right now. So Victor, I'd be curious as to, you, you've obviously looked at the British system as well as the US system. Would you want an Ofcom to come to the, to the US? Would that help the US or would you want a different kind of um, regulator altogether? Well, we already have something not completely dissimilar to Ofcom, which is the Federal Communications Commission. And, um, I, you know, I think absolutely we need a regulatory agency, but I would like to see it radically democratized, um, that actually it's in constant dialogue with the public. I really want to underscore what James said earlier. I mean, journalism produces information. Our news media system produces information that really is a public good. It should not be subjected entirely to the market. We need to take it out of the market, but we also need to democratize it. We need to make sure the government doesn't control our media as well. And uh, so I think based on these radical democratic principles, we can imagine how a more democratic Ofcom uh, might look. Right now, too often, these regulatory agencies come under regulatory capture, and they basically internalize the logics of the industries they're supposed to regulate. So I think we can think of something better, um, and that's what we should always be doing. I mean, again, going back, that's what I like about the Eric Olin Wright approach, is that these, these radical and real-life utopias, we have to keep those objectives in mind and work towards them. It might take us 50 years before we get there, but it's important to have the vision in place. Okay, I've been told I've got to start. Oh, I think we've got Hillary joining us just in time for my yeah, last question. I'm so sorry, I, I think I'm just desperate to get back to real live meetings. <laughs> <laughs> Aren't we all? Okay, um, so that's great that you've been able to join us just for one, one last question. 
And my last question is really looking at what is the one policy, if we were to ask for, for one policy, um, that would that you would be pushing for with regards to, to media reform? I'm really interested in what you were saying, Hilary, with regards to, um, I'd never heard it before about France and Italy being forced to carry publications. So I don't know if we, that would be your one policy um, or the what you're talking about, Victor, with regards to um, creating a fund from um, taxation of some of the tech giants. But if there was one policy, um, we'll, I'll let Hillary catch her breath after, considering that she's obviously had to try and catch up. But James, if there was one policy that we needed that you would want to push for. Um, so maybe it's not necessarily my only one. We've, all the ones we've mentioned so far this evening are great, but I'll throw in one other one, which is uh, to have um, public interest provisions once uh, a media group gets to a certain size. So basically, once you get a private media group gets sufficiently powerful, that it's got a sufficient market share, then things kick in. Those things could be um, readers' representatives on uh, on the board, the election of editors by journalists. Uh, that could, you know, th these sorts of these sorts of things, so that we break the idea that private media companies are private and they are the domain of the billionaire owners who they are. They produce something which the journalists have ownership over, and we as the public have ownership over, and so we should have a say as a kind of uh, transitionary policy, we should have a say and the journalists should have a say and they should let, elect their own bosses. Oh, I like that. Okay. I hadn't actually, I've never heard that policy before. I really like that one. Okay. Victor. Yeah, I really like James's policy. So I'll just build on that. I'll, I'll marry what he says to this bigger idea that we've been hitting at throughout the discussion is that we need a massive public media fund that is that is guaranteed by our governments, by our respective governments, by the UK and US government, but that the government has absolutely no control. It's just automatically funded, it's set aside, and then it's locally determined how that money gets allocated towards news deserts, towards communities that are most underserved, especially communities of color, and that journalists themselves uh, are, are running their own newsrooms. I think that is key. So again, it's that principle of decommercializing our media system, but also radically democratizing it. Okay, I like that. So we've got basically changing the editorial board or democratizing the, the editorial boards, looking at, at funding. Um, and Hillary, what would yeah, be your I, one policy? I think um, the, the basic um, objective uh, has already been outlined really and agreed probably by both James and Victor, which is to break the, the monopoly of the market over the media and establish the idea of the media and everything it pro should provide in terms of information, debate, opinions, multiple voices, inclusive voices, as a public good. And for that, I think the funding, you know, the idea now, you know, it's completely accepted that the government funds private companies. You know, that's just part of the economy. Well, you know, this should be this should be turned round so that it's the idea of the government is to fund bodies of public good and public interest, which should be a plurality of media institutions, not for profit, cooperatives, community, local, but also, you know, alternative, which could be national. So I think that idea of a fund tied into regulation of any um, private company is crucial. And I'd, I suppose since you've already in a way outlined that, I would add this question of um, distribution, that that too must be publicly regulated. And every, every, um, every publication that's printed should have a right to be displayed. So that distribution shouldn't be simply about the market, but should be about availability of plural voices. Well, I, I think I very rarely hear about distribution whenever there are discussions about um, media reform. And I think that that is something that which I will definitely be taking away with me to think about more. And I'd be um, curious as to how that actually works out with regards to um, distribution on in a digital 
world and, and algorithms as well. So some really interesting things to, to think about. And I'd just like to say as I, as I round up that the idea that um, uh, this was going to be just about a critique of media and not coming with solutions and envisaging a, a future with a better media um, has thankfully been proven wrong. And I think all three panelists were able to give us really interesting visions as to what um, the media could and, and should look like. So I will close by saying a huge thanks to all our panelists today and for everybody that's joined us and all the discussions. There was just so much to get through and we barely scratched the surface. Um, and it's such an important conversation. And finally, the media, this is the kind of public announcement bit. Um, the Media Reform Coalition is a voluntary organization that survives mostly on thin air and some kind donors. Um, for these debates, we would like to acknowledge the support of Byline Times, the Independent Media Association, the Canary, um, Squawk Box, Bywire News, Manchester Meteor. Um, if you would like to support the work of the Media Reform Coalition, then please follow the links which will come on the closing slide um, when I say goodbye and thank you once again to absolutely everybody else and all the all the panelists and all the di discussions. Oh, and one last thing I've just been reminded, um, you can of course subscribe to redpepper.org.uk. So thank you very much, Hilary, for reminding me of that. Okay, thank you so much. <laughs>